anytime an invasive species pops up in a new area, what do you think happens? What, what, what is the first thing that happens? The biggest problem with invasive species is we don't know. We don't know what they're, we have no idea what they're going to do first. That's what's terrifying about it. What are they going to eat first? What are they going to focus on in the beginning? What part of the food web is going to be hit the hardest? How does this affect the overall ecosystem? How does this affect my fishing? And will local wildlife agencies treat it as a priority? Well, thanks to flatheads being introduced to the East Coast, we have the answers to all these things. But before we get into exactly what all these things are, let's look at the immediate response by wildlife agencies. The first thing that usually occurs is notification. They notify everybody, inform the public. This is usually followed by a series of information dumps and usually a hit piece. These are meant to familiarize the public and spread awareness of the potential hazards involved. The hit piece is really designed to kind of express to people how important it is and to make sure that none of these fish go back into the water. So they're telling them all of the things that they don't want to have happen, whether they're going to happen or not. So after the eradication programs, after the commercial incentives for, for commercial fishermen, all of those things in an effort to slow their advance, something miraculous happens. Something that wouldn't happen in any other circumstance. A ton of money and resources gets pumped into a better understanding of these fish in a way that we would never have known. That's the significance of what's going on on the East Coast with the flathead catfish. So let's get right into it. Um, just some really cool information that we would never have known had this stuff not happened, right? What is the first thing that flatheads target in a new river system? Well, as it turns out, if you remember a video I made a while back about the three most common fish we found in flathead stomachs. Those were freshwater drum, red horse suckers, and buffalo. What's crazy is the information was always there right in our faces. We've always known these things, but we never quite put them together in a way that made us say, oh my gosh, yeah. Because if they're doing it here, where they're supposed to be, but then they go over there and they do it, but they're doing it to completely different fish. But ironically, those fish are all doing almost the exact same thing. And we're gonna talk about that here in just a minute. It's, it's very revealing about these fish. So let's, let's talk about mostly the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. A lot of the really good research that's being done on flatheads is going on there because these people are putting a ton of effort into understanding them because they're terrified of their f freshwater fishery. Like they, it's very important to them and flatheads have invaded it. And so the, to say that they've put resources into it is, is really an understatement. The first fish appeared somewhere around 2002. I actually found one report from the mid nineties, uh, but I couldn't confirm it. All of these fish in the early years were in the one to five pound range. And in the early years, a 15 pound fish was considered to be a big fish. That's like in their research, they classified a 15 pound fish as a big fish. But as time went on, flatheads do what flatheads do, they started seeing 25, 30 pound fish. That's when biologists started really getting nervous. In 2023, there was a 66 pound flathead that was caught that is now the current Pennsylvania state record flathead. And it was caught as an invasive species. Once flatheads reach these sizes, the proverbial dam has burst, essentially. There's no stopping them. This essentially means they have everything that they need. They have spawning habitat, they have forage, and they have wintering holes. They have everything that they need. I got the sense from listening to biologists in interviews on podcasts and television and, and reading about the things that they were writing in their reports that they really believed in the early years that there was hope. There was hope that they were gonna be able to stop the spread and, and actually make a meaningful impact on the ecosystem in a positive way and, and eradicating most of the flatheads, if not all of them. They, they really believed that. They also believed that they would, there was a lot of watersheds that have cold water mountain runoff and they really believed that those fish were not gonna move up into those areas and that some of those areas were gonna be safe. But slowly but surely, they're slowly finding their way 
up into these tributaries and they're finding flatheads there. Most of these tributaries were thought to be almost uninhabitable to flatheads. They were mostly supposed to just be inhabited by cold water fishes, uh, things like trout and things like that. What they're finding is as the population grows and the density of the population grows, flatheads are being pushed out into these areas and they have no problem doing it. So what are they eating? This is very telling. What are, they, what are these things eating? Well, during a 2020 and 2021 study, roughly 40% of the fish surveyed. Now, when I say surveyed, what I mean is they pulled the fish out of the water and they cut them open. 40% of the fish had rusty crawfish in their stomachs. And this was representative of all flatheads, not just little ones, it was all of them. We're talking about the one pounders and the 40 pounders. Rusty crawfish seemed to be the staple of their diets. Rusty crawfish, where do crawfish live in the water? They live on the bottom, okay? One other side note, as a bycatch, a lot of rocks were found in the stomachs of flatheads, a lot of rocks. Weirdly enough, smaller flatheads showed a proclivity to eating channel catfish, while the larger flatheads showed a tendency to prefer smallmouth bass, actually. Now that could just be a fluke in the data, but it's what the data said. These are, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish, by the way. This wasn't a, a sample where they went out in two days. This sample, this, this study's been going on for years, and this is what they're finding. So the smaller flatheads tend to be going after channel cats, and the bigger flatheads are chasing smallmouth bass. Let's look at the Carolinas. The Yadkin River, for example, it saw a sharp decline in its two main catfish species, the snail bullhead and the flat bullhead. Electroshock surveys uh, from 2005 to 2012 in Yadkin and Wilkes County actually confirmed this, uh, that there was a dramatic decrease in these fish's population. That centers are right around the time that flatheads were introduced. So while we were on the Carolinas, I decided to contact another YouTuber uh, who films down there and has been there for a long time and really understands the water and knows the water pre-flathead versus post. So I sent him an email. This is Mr. Dieter Melhorn. And I basically asked him how have flatheads impacted the Catawba River watershed. He says, and I'm quoting, just go right down the email. Let me start by saying that correlation does not always equal causation. While these observations of the decline in size and numbers of some fish populations coincide with the increase in flathead population, it may or may not be solely tied to the flathead catfish. With that said, since the rapid expansion of the flathead catfish throughout the river basin took place over the last 10 to 15 years, the white catfish have virtually disappeared in about the same time frame. Two more species, the red ear sunfish, also known as the shellcracker, uh, and bluegill appear to have decreased in upper end sizes. While still plentiful, the fish remain small compared to my harvest 10 to 15 years ago. My cursory observations are that the flathead might be blamed for these sunfish not reaching a mature class in numbers like they once did. I could go on for days uh, on this topic of invasive and non-native fishes. So that's Dieter's observation of what's going on and I, I would be very inclined to heed what he is saying because he lives there and he, he lived there when they weren't there and he lived where when they weren't there, when they were there, excuse me. So one very important thing that he says is correlation doesn't always mean causation. One of the big problems that many of these studies don't talk about is blue cats have also been introduced to these same waters at and around the same time. So we don't know if it's flatheads, we don't know if it's blue cats, or if it's a combination of both, or it could be something else. I would say it's at least a combination of both. I'm going to briefly mention the Santee Cooper. I don't really think there's much to speak on there. I think everybody understands what happened at Santee Cooper uh, with blue cats in the 1970s, I believe, it was the early 70s. Uh, I'm not even really gonna touch on it because everything there was devastated by blue cats. I, know, and I, I don't think that flatheads are playing that big of a role there. South Odesto River uh, in South Carolina is another example of flathead introduction uh, that is vastly shrinking the bullhead and sunfish population. This is all confirmed by electroshock studies as well. 
Going back to North Carolina, however, I really want to talk about the Noose River and the Carolina Mad, Mad Toms. If you're unfamiliar with what Mad Toms are, they're, uh, they're basically the smallest species of catfish. And there's a bunch of different kinds. Uh, I think there's something like 30 total different varieties of Mad Tom catfish, spreading all the way from Canada to Mexico. But there's one endemic specifically to North Carolina, and it's called the Carolina Mad Tom and it's the only place in the world that they're found. They're now an endangered species, and it is believed largely due to the flathead catfish. The Noose River water dog, which is a giant salamander that is native only to this river system, uh, is also in sharp decline and is now endangered. If you want the exact numbers, I was able to find some of them on the Mad Toms, the Carolina Mad Tom. They've lost approximately 64% of their native distribution and the water dogs have lost approximately 35% of their native distribution. Two more species we need to talk about are the American Shad and the Hickory Shad. The reason I bring those two up is because flatheads somehow get thrown into that conversation. I don't think flatheads are contributing to the declining numbers of Hickory Shad or American Shad. I think that's probably more of a blue cat problem than anything, because that's what blue cats do. Blue cats are uh, pursuit predators in, in the greatest extent. They, that's what they do. They chase baits. Uh, flatheads are more of a sit around. It, it just seems to me like there's not enough of them to disrupt whole migrations of hickory and American shad. It's just simply, I, I don't think that those are synonymous with one another, flatheads in the, in the decline in hickory shad and American shad. So my conclusion to all this is that if you look at all of the species that flatheads are targeting, I've always considered it flatheads would be a lazy fish. And I always, cons I, I always just sort of assumed that the reason why I always found drum and red horse suckers and buffalo inside their stomachs so often was because that's, those fish lived where they lived. They lived near the bottom. We never could have really drawn that conclusion without these studies, without this happening. We know more about flatheads in the last 20 years than we probably would in the last 200 years. Because without that clean slate, we drop them off, they can do whatever they want to do. They can chase bass, they can chase shad, they can eat birds, they can, they can do whatever they want to do. But what did they choose to do? They chose to do the same things, but with different fish. So it, sort of, it, it really sort of hit home that these fish don't care what they eat, as long as it's easy for them to get. And why is it easy? Because it lives where they live. It lives in the places of the river where they live. Crawfish live in the bottom. They live in rocks, smallmouth bass. Now, they absolutely traverse the water columns, but smallmouth bass are tenderly caught in deeper water. Channel catfish, it's a catfish. It hangs out near the bottom. All the mad tom species, they're catfish. They live near the bottom. All the bullheads, they live near the bottom. Let me, I think one fish that I didn't really touch on that well was the white catfish. The white catfish have been absolutely devastated by the flatheads. Absolutely devastated. Now, they're not the only ones. They're cohabiting with blue cats, invasive, and channel cats, which are sometimes invasive in some of these places. The white catfish, if you've never seen a white catfish, I personally have never seen one in real life, but I've seen lots of pictures of them. They're almost completely gone. They're almost completely gone. Like, like we're in danger possibly of losing that species uh, entirely on the East Coast, gone. And that's their native home range. They've been introduced in other places. I think there's a place in Missouri and a place in Arkansas where they were introduced. And they're introduced, I believe, in places in California like the Sacramento Delta and places like that where white, fish, white catfish have been introduced. However, in their native distribution, they're gone. Almost, completely. I spent about a month and a half reading everything that wildlife agencies did in an effort to quell and to get on top of this. If I had one thing that I could say to them, I would probably say, it, it was very apparent to me that these people didn't really understand what they were dealing with. They're dealing with what is quite possibly the most 
well-engineered, most gifted freshwater predator, piscivore, as they're called, anywhere in North America. They have a giant mouth. They have a powerful tail. They have a sleek design that allows them to suck themselves to the bottom and become part of it and become invisible. I guess if I could say one thing, and this really holds true for almost any invasive species anywhere, certainly the flathead. Everything that these government agencies do never works. It has never worked ever. The eradication programs, the commercial incentives, it's never worked. Not with a predator like this. Flathead catfish have really, they've done this all over the United States. Florida probably led the charge more than anybody, anybody, in the effort to fight against the flathead catfish. Every study that they did in Florida, 20 years after, 15 years after, 25 years after, every study said that the flatheads did not hurt the sunfish population. In fact, they made it more healthy, more vibrant. Florida spent tens of millions of dollars trying to eradicate flatheads, and all they got for it was more flatheads. Pennsylvania is still sort of in the midst of this fight where they're doing the same things. North Carolina did it. North Carolina has sort of taken the stance of, we're not gonna spend a lot of money to eradicate you. We're just not gonna spend any money to help you. Sort of a sleep at the wheel sort of a policy, I guess. I don't know, mild neglect. Santee Cooper, South Carolina, they sort of embraced them. Parts of North Carolina have also embraced them. Uh, the sport fishing community all up and down the East Coast. Virginia spent a little bit of money uh, trying to eradicate them, but their focus was mo mo mostly on blue cats and it still is to this day. Um, but Pennsylvania, they're really right in the midst of it right now. And they're making all the same mistakes that Florida made, North Carolina made, uh, that Virginia has made. Uh, they're throwing a lot of money at it. A lot of energy and a lot of effort. I'm grateful because we wouldn't have this information without it. However, I, I think that uh, trying to build a wall to hold back the ocean is probably not the way to live with an ocean. Uh, it's, you know, it's sort of something you just need to learn to live with. My, the, the best advice I could give you if you're a wildlife agency or somebody that wants to take part in this and do something about it is you don't fight the flatheads. I'm not saying that you shouldn't issue orders like you can't throw any of them back. That's certainly useful. Uh, but if you really want to make a difference, instead of spending tens of millions on getting rid of flatheads, which you'll never do, you will never win, maybe you should take those tens of millions and put it into habitat for native species. Put it into stocking programs for native species. Put it into genetic reproduction programs for, gen for, for native species. In other words, you should be doing anything and everything possible to give the native fish that live in your environment every possible opportunity to survive the onslaught, if that's what you'll call it, that is coming at them. Give them the resources. Don't give the resources to the flatheads, right? Give them to the fish that need them. That's my take on it. That's really all I have to talk about today on the flathead catfish. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, there will be no more music in my videos as far as I'm concerned. Music is $126 a year, which doesn't sound like much, but I just don't feel like paying those people that kind of money for like a five or six second outro. like. And I don't think anybody cares. Um, I have another video coming about uh, a lot of things. Yeah. So we're going to get to it. Hope you enjoyed that one. I'll see you in the next one.